Sam, could you give a sentence or two about your general background and what brings you to this event today? Okay, uh, graduated from Stanford, got involved in software, did some projects for the government. In the government, we started building hypertext and mapping systems, and that led to Doug, that led to funding Doug, that led, then led to the 40th anniversary where I was a part of the planning group. And then uh, we did another conference in 2010. So we're planning another third conference in December 9th of this year. So this is third in the series of Program for the Future conferences. So, what's, so been that's your, what's, here. what's been your basic association with Doug Engelbart? I first came across him in 1991. And as I mentioned, we were doing projects for the government and really building very, let's say, heavy intelligence fusion systems that try to bring data of all different kinds together. So it pretty much wanted to be a hypertext system. And so we wanted to build uh, on existing hypertext technology, and that led us to Doug. We then ended up uh, going, myself and uh, my senior architect, and we went to Doug's uh, workshop, March of 1992. And through that, got the entire vision, not just the hypertext vision. And it was, as a result, I've been basically trying to either apply it or develop it further ever since. So, so that's what I've been doing. How, how would you describe Doug's vision? It sounds like you're attempting to implement it. How would you describe it in a, a couple of sentences? Doug's vision, the unimplemented part, is always the part about the human system side. Actually, you know, deep into the guts and the, uh, the heart of people, okay? Because too much has already been said about the technology side, but not enough has been said about why teams fall apart or why teams don't even come together in the first place, or how hard it is for people to actually align and then do a common shared vision, okay? So that side of things and that exploration of things is, I'm, I'm finding, difficult to do in Silicon Valley because people love talking about technology. It's easy to talk about technology. They shirk away from things about, you know, agendas, uh, compensation, team dynamics, egos, psychology, you know, under the table movement, you know. These things are very difficult for people who are technologists to acknowledge. I'm actually finding a lot more receptivity for these ideas outside Silicon Valley than inside Silicon Valley. Is it that technologists are different from, say, marketers or business people? No. No. Everybody's all people. But when people have problems in team dynamics, it's always the team, or it's always somebody else, or it's the boss. It's never themselves, or it's never the way it starts, you know? One of the great sayings I like is uh, teams don't go wrong or projects don't go wrong. They start wrong. Okay. And so if people don't actually have the right kind of understanding at the start, sooner or later, that miscommunication is going to show up uh, either in the middle of the project or at the end of the project or somewhere else. Okay. And that's the stuff that people don't understand yet. You mean they're not really working for the same goal so they can't agree on what to do? They may have goal differences, they may have completeness differences, they may have style differences, they may have communications differences, they may have, you know, logistics differences, and all of that can lead to missed expectations. Now, if people are all on a payroll and they're getting paid to fulfill the vision of the person who's running the group, uh, regardless of what their personal motivation is, shouldn't they mm -hmm. be able to work together? Yeah, but that's the easy case. See, the easy case is when you've got somebody clearly in charge and clearly authoritarian. If Doug wants to scale collaboration planet-wide, globally, okay, you cannot assume there's any single individual or company or nation or continent that's going to be in charge telling people what to do. Okay? So now autonomous entities have to come together and align. And that's what's difficult, because now you've got to get millions or billions or at least thousands of people together. And now, how do you do that in such a way that scales and can actually then accomplish things quickly? Is it theoretically possible to do that, or is the whole concept basically impossible considering human nature? I think it's possible, but I think the way to do it is to layer a level, uh, kind of a, a layer of consciousness on top of what people are already doing and not to tell people how to do things differently, okay? And I think that layering of consciousness and that practice of transparency, of communication, of uh, really being um, engaging, really doing retrospectives, really kind of doing peer review, really being uh, in alignment and being accountable to your own you know, expression, to your own objectives, to the way you do things. That, I think, is what we're trying to offer as a meta model for how we actually get this uh, consciousness injected into business and operations. So it was Doug basically about changing human consciousness? I think Doug was about both, but the side that was about the human side is the de-emphasized 
uh, side. And that's the piece that I think has not yet been fully explored. And that's why technology continues to astound us and surprise us and generating quote unquote unintended consequences. They're not unintended. You're just too stupid to try and figure out, you know, what was actually going to happen, you know? So this phrase of unintended consequences is a misnomer, you know? It's the fact that people think too simplistically about the technology. Is the human <clears throat> side simply harder than the technological side? It's harder because people don't like dealing with it. Now, did Doug have any approach for dealing with it? Because if he's working with technology and people, uh, he's very good at technology, invented a lot of new things that didn't exist before. Did he achieve any advances on the human side? How did he get people to do things? I would say on that side, uh, recognizably, uh, he didn't. And I think uh, there's lots of stories about why that didn't happen. But he recognized the importance of it. I mean, he was involved in EST. He was involved, involved with uh, Werner Erhardt. He was actually on the board. And uh, he recognized that that was a part that needed to be developed. Okay, And yet, that's a side of the Doug story that doesn't get a lot of play right now. Um, people are always astounded by the technology. They're all astounded by oh, you know, this Moore's Law phenomenon but they're not yet astounded by how much further our, our uh, social and uh, civilization constructs are uh, because they've been essentially the same for 200 years in this country and they've not really uh, evolved much uh, beyond where they existed uh, 200 years ago. What do you think uh, Doug will be most remembered for? <sighs> That's the toughest question you've asked me, okay? Because I think uh, if you're talking about personally, uh, he, was a, he was a very kind person. He loved children. If you're talking about globally, I think people don't take the time to understand the story. They're just going to understand the mouse. They're just going to understand hypertext. Even though there's, there's outline processing, there's word processing, there's multimedia, all the other stuff that there's a litany of uh, things. That's what people are going to understand because that's the simple sound bite that people are going to get. Okay? Nobody's actually very um, appreciative enough yet. Not nobody but most are not appreciative enough to really get the comprehensive story and just the immensity of what it really means. Do you have any additional thoughts about him that you'd like to share based on your experience or your understanding of his ideas? Anything you like? I think Doug suffers from a misrepresentation of being hard to work with. In my experience with Doug, which was from 91 to about 93 and then on and off spotty, you know, up until um, even January, he was always very interested in dialogue. He was always very interested in understanding, you know, how to create common understanding, understanding someone as a person. I never saw the side of him that was hard to deal with, that was too demanding, that was, you know, saying, you're wrong. I mean, I've heard those stories. I've heard lots of these stories. But that's not been my experience. 